posters? Yeah. Sweet. Got a little captain in you. Drink responsibly. To make the dice roll his way. Hello. You need to come pick up your son. But life is more complicated than dice. Joe Dumas, the winner! He turns 21 in three weeks. He's got to move on. I spoke to the woman. She told me about his place. That for kids like this. It's very expensive. That's why we got to make the score, Janice. Just let me go home. Don't you think I would if I could? I'm not going to turn my back on you. Now, he's not only raising the stakes. I say we make a move or we can grab the most money, and that's Vegas. Security in Vegas is ten times tougher. And your daddy's got a set, let me tell you. He's raising a son. I love you, Dad. I am going to help this kid right now. The perfect score. Listen, I came up with something. Grab the dice with an open hand. I'm going to whip it fast. We got about eight or ten rolls before the heat comes down. So every bet counts. An unlikely team. If you do take a blow, what happens to you? He has caught every bed break a human being could catch, including me for a father. Right or wrong, he's part of something. He's part of this. And the man at the heart of it all. Uh, let's go. Academy Award nominee Chaz Palminteri. Academy Award nominee Christine Motti. Thomas Guyry. Linus Roach. And Academy Award nominee Michael Lerner. Joe Duma, the winner! <laughs> they were not playing <laughs> Yonkers Joe. How do you put this together, the story? Where does it start? You have to really attempt to do something great. And the way that I, it doesn't mean it's going to be, but you have to approach it like that. Tell me that story again about Peter. Peter Bondanovich was working uh, fresh and Wells. Mm -hmm. He's an actor in the movie, so he's breaking the walls. He's going, Mr. Wells, what's my motivation for running over there? And Wells says, uh, I'll tell you when you get here. <laughs> for sure. What was it like behind the scenes working with Chaz Palmitieri? I mean, he's special because he's always having a good time. He's always, uh, you know, telling jokes, and he's the person, I don't have to tell stories if he's around, because he's telling, he's just a natural entertainer. I mean, if you see him in, in uh, Bronx Tale, he plays 19 characters. Some of them are sympathetic, some of them are horrifying, some of them are funny, but he keeps you captivated. He just knows how to do that. So he does the same thing on a set. And, and I had a wonderful experience with Chaz because he really cared about the movie, and that, and we thought... But we fought, every time we fought, there was an underlining degree of devotion for the project. He fought to make it better, I fought to make it better. It was never about anybody being lazy or somebody not wanting to do anything, or it was never about ego. But the thing that, uh, that, I, that I really loved about working with Chaz is that he cared so much about the work. Let's talk about your education. You mentioned you went to the new school. Mm -hmm. What kind of experience was it? So the new school was, was great. That's really where I learned how to become a filmmaker. What motivated you to become a filmmaker? Why did you choose to go to the new school? I learned filmmaking. Now they say that, I mean, where else are you going to get a camera, get a film, be able to use a crew, utilize a crew, the experience of your teachers uh, for that uh, cheap. So, and that's how you learn how to make film is by making them. A uh, film school is nothing more than a, a cheap rental house or something like that. Uh, but of course, what was wonderful about the, the new school is that we got to make film. We got to make film with Bolex cameras, where, uh, uh, with, uh, you know, where um, we shot black and white uh, without sound, non-sync sound, MOS. And then we, decided, we graduated into shooting uh, with sound. And, and uh, we did everything. We lit, we shot, we cut, and we did it for each other. If it was my script, everybody in the class came and, and worked on my film. If it was someone else's, we all did. I can't tell you because of my height how many times I was uh, elected to hold the boom, you know, because I could get that boom up there. So, uh, you know, and I learned so much watching uh, other students and other directors. So we were always working on film. One of the best things, pieces of advice I ever heard from another filmmaker was Roger Corman, where he just said, Hi, what's the best thing to do to make a film and, and he'd say just get a comfortable pair of shoes. You, you have to keep making, keeping your priorities uh, straight. When you take a fish out of the water, he, he dies. You know, one decision is much more important than the other, but as a director you're constantly asking questions. You know, uh, what are you going to have for lunch compared to how you're going to break down this very important seat? Mike Nichols one time in an interview saying uh, uh, someone would come over and ask him how many people you want to see? And Robin Batten and I, he said 30. 
Then another person would come over and say, well, what color do you want that car to be? Before you even finish, he said, blue. So the, the interviewer said, how do you know this so quickly? And he says, it doesn't matter if there's 30 or 50 people in the scene. It doesn't matter if the car's blue or green. What matters is that I'm telling you. Tell me about um, uh, the movie Mr. Vincent. Well, Mr. Vincent came after a, a bad experience I had with, uh, with making my first feature, True Convictions, that I made when I just came out of film school. And uh, we just had a tough time with it. it, it, it I, I wound up selling my house and trying to get money any way I could to, to, um, to make the film. And it was one of those stories that are more common. We didn't succeed. We lost, we, you know, with the film, uh, I shot it in Super 16. And when we went to go blow it up to 35, uh, we didn't have the money and the, and the laboratory auctioned the negative. So the film never got a chance to get seen. It was just a great experience in getting knocked down and learning how to get back up because you know, nobody really gets life lessons from success. You get them from the beatings you take in life. Hi, this is Barbara Ritchie. I'm here with the director of Yonkers Joe. Let's go to a break. We'll be right back. I make a lasagna, I take all day. My tables are empty anyway. A tragedy, I make a lasagna so perfectly. Bertoli! It's a tragedy for chefs. With new Bertoli oven baked meals, you can have classic dishes like lasagna rustica baked in your own oven dish and prepared with your personal touch. We can't say it's homemade, but you can. Bertoli. New Bertoli oven baked meals. Okay, we're back, and we're here with Rob Celestino from Yonkers, the director of Yonkers Joe. 24 days, that's all we had. And we shot in three cities. We shot in Vegas, we shot in L.A., and we shot in New York. So these are cities that we had to get on planes, and we still stood within the, the 24 days uh, schedule. Let's talk about the actor Tom, who played the artistic son. Tom Guyry's work and saying, wow, I mean, Tom would, would, uh, would transform on the set. How do you put this together, the story? It's been a passion of mine for since I, you know, for for a very long time. What's the lowest common denominator of each scene? What is this scene about at its basic core, where you cannot go any lower? And from that comes what needs to be done in the acting, comes what needs to be done in the visual, comes what needs to be done in the sound. All the stuff that all these plastic elements that are, are going to come in come from just knowing what the basic, uh, the lowest common denominator is. The way that I, I start, and I always do this, is I, is I start with a premise that's impossible. I mean, what if I said to you, what I told you I did just could not be done? Now, if I told you that you were going to take a mentally challenged character who was going to go into a casino and take it down, would you believe it? I mean, when you consider the, the, the amount of money that these casinos spend on surveillance, and the quality of surveillance is the most sophisticated surveillance for any commercial enterprise on the planet that's, you know, that's commercial. And the idea that anyone can go in there and, and, uh, and cheat them is, uh, is hard to believe. But to have a mentally challenged person go in and do it. So I started with that premise and then I said, well, listen, if, if, I say to myself, if I can find a way to, to make it believable, because as a filmmaker, I don't care about what's realistic. I only care about what's believable. You're listening to Studio 43 New York Live. I'm your host, Barbara Ritchie. This is Talk Radio. My guest today is the filmmaker Robert Celestino. <laughs> 